Welcome to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution with your host, Bill O'Brien. Welcome to today's program on the Virtual Center for the Study of the U.S. Constitution. I'm Bill O'Brien, and I am so glad that you could join us for today's program. Uh, uh, let me uh, begin by uh, giving you the phone numbers and encourage you to to make a call. And uh, I have a, a family uh, member uh, who listens, my brother, uh, listens and, and uh Reminded me last night that I give the number at the beginning, but I can't. I need to give it more often, and I and I I know he's right. I just forget to do it. Um, I'm learning this uh, as we go, so uh, this is a work in progress. And and um, uh, let me let me again give you uh, both the email address, the uh, email address, and the phone number if you'd like to uh, join us on the air and, and 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 talk a little bit about this. I would love to to do that. The number to call is 304-658-3333. That's area code 304-658-3333. And if you call that number, we'll get you on the air, and we can talk. Uh, I would love to to do that. I think it would be uh, very, very uh, not only enjoyable for me and, and hopefully for you, but I think those folks listening would uh, would much prefer to hear another voice besides mine, I'm sure. And um, so I look forward to, to hearing from you. Uh, if you have a comment or, uh, you know, toward the end of the program or you'd like to make a comment on the program or, or some other program that we've done, I know a lot of folks uh, uh, download these programs uh, on I. I pods and listen to them uh, at their convenience and and so sometimes people are listening to programs that are two or three days old or a week old or whatever and i understand that that's fine uh, but if you uh, are inclined to make a comment about a program even if it's not today's uh, by all means you can you can do that uh, my email address is w a o'brien o-b-r-i-e-n uh, all one word w a o'brien nine zero six nine oh six at gmail dot com that's w a o'brien nine oh six at gmail dot com and i will be glad to acknowledge receipt of your email and we might end up in engaging in a little bit of uh back and forth or, or whatever um i've had a few folks make comments on yesterday's program um and i i you know, very honestly, most of the comments have been uh, have been kind, uh, but the fact of the matter is, a, a almost ninety percent of yesterday's program is uh, due primarily to James Madison. Uh, very, very little to me. Um, it was kind of a straight up program where an awful lot of the uh, information that I was presenting was uh, in Madison's vices of the American political system. Um, vices of the political system of the United States is the exact copy. So again, if you uh, uh, want to check up on that document, uh, just uh, go to Google on your internet, on your browser, and just Google in vices of the political system of the United States, Madison, and you will find uh, a a copy of it and probably some uh, reaction. We will remember that, that and we spent most of yesterday's program on that document. Uh, we went through Madison lists uh, 12 uh, vices of the political system. Uh, remember, he's writing in April. This is this is is written in April of 1787. It's obviously a prelude to the Constitutional Convention that's going to begin in May, the very next month. Um, he's sending this to selected friends. Um, in other words, it, it speaks very well. I mean, histo- when we're talking about uh, the importance of historical context, uh, understanding not just what happens historically, but also the circumstances which produce it, um, the circumstances which surround it. And a lot of times the meaning becomes so much more uh, easy to understand, more, or you, uh, more, it makes a lot more sense once you understand the context within which a certain thing emerges. Madison is preparing for the conference, for the 
uh, what is going to be the Constitutional Convention in May of 1787. Uh, obviously, this document is so significant for a number of reasons. One of them, and I think a key one, is that a month before a major conference like this one is going to turn out to be, this is the thinking of the person that probably is most active, uh, m most uh, proactive in bringing the conference about. In other words, what we're seeing in Madison's vices of the political system of the United States is his thinking at the time as to what the priorities of this coming convention must be. And in doing this, he is laying out to those he trusts uh, what he sees as the major issues of the Confederation that need repair, and that need fixing, that need addressing. One of the things that, that we pointed out, that I tried to point out yesterday, was our... You remember that one of the concerns that, that Madison has, one of, the, one of the vices, if you will, is that the Confederation, the Articles of Confederation, were never approved by the people of the states. Rather, they were approved. They were ratified by state legislatures. And Madison saw this as a, as a serious defect. And obviously, he's going to make sure that the Constitution that comes out of this coming convention the next month is, is, go, is not going to suffer from that same defect. And as we know, uh, when the convention nears its end, the convention agrees that the Constitution, as drafted, will be submitted uh, to the, not to the states, but will be submitted to special conventions of the people in each state. And then each state holds elections where the people are given the opportunity to choose the delegates to these state ratifying conventions. And of course, the campaigning that goes on in each state between Federalists and Anti-Federalists, between proponents of the new Constitution and opponents of the new Constitution gives people the basis on which to choose either opponents or proponents, supporters of the Constitution. And once the Constitution is ratified by these conventions, then Madison's concern has been addressed because this new Constitution has been ratified by the people of the nation. And, and that we talked a little, quite a bit about that, about that yesterday. One of the, the items that we looked at was Article 2 of the Confederation. And again, Article 2 of the Confederation is almost verbatim an amendment to the Bill of Rights, to the Constitution of the United States. And basically, the Article 2 of the, of the Articles of Confederation says very, very clearly, powers not expressly granted to Congress, to the central government, are reserved to the states or to the people. The key word there is the word expressly, because the inclusion of that word in Article 2 of the Articles of Confederation means that there's no interpretation, there's no flexibility at all. If the power is not given within the document to the central government, then that power is reserved to the states or to, and to the people of the states. So what that means is, since there's no mention in the Articles of Confederation that Congress will have the power to tax, then obviously that means that the central government must depend on revenue from the states who do have the power to tax their own citizens. But the central government does not. The central government does not have the power to raise an army. But the states do. In their constitutions, they raise state militias. So what that means, then, any, that means is that any kind of a national military effort in order to conduct such, Congress must request military support, troops, resources, etc., from the states. But if you read the Articles of Confederation, you will see that there are a number of powers that are granted to the central government. The power to regulate trade, the power to control the territories, the power to regulate relationships with, with the Indians, um, the power to conduct a post office, uh, the power to improve roads, 
etc., etc., etc. In other words, the central government is assigned powers that the states believe the central government ought to be ought to function when the best interest of the entire group of states is at issue, rather than the state, that rather than the than issues relating to only one state or to the people of that state. So, and Madison points out that that even though the central government is assigned certain powers under the Confederation, frequently the states infringe on those powers. Uh, and so, therefore, the system, as Madison sees it, is broken. And again, Madison makes very clear that because the Articles of Confederation was not ratified by the people, but rather by the states, then it does not really constitute a constitution as such, a system of government with the authority to govern over people. Rather, since it was ratified by each state, it, in effect, is merely an alliance among equal states. It is a, a you know, it is a confederacy of equal states. French, kind of like the United Nations with the nations that belong to it. There's absolutely no question that that model is the same. That, you know, you have a a central power, the United Nations, and then you have the nations that belong to it. But the real power in the central government, you know, in the United Nations, comes from the nations which belong to it. So if the United Nations is going to engage in any kind of military action or police action or whatever anywhere in the world, it has to get the approval of the membership to do it. And that's exactly the same model that the Confederation was was based upon. I find it interesting because the Confederation period is one of those periods in American history that receives very little attention uh, uh, from from you know in our textbooks, in our schools, etc. The only mention of the Confederation period usually is to point out the problems that the nation is experiencing in order to lay the groundwork for the new Constitution that's going to come. Theoretically, you know, we we have the euphoria that 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 um, uh, accompanies the peace treaty of 1783, and the fact that the United that, that the new nation is successful in achieving its independence from Great Britain. So we have this euphoria. Then we have the period from 83 to 86, the the three or four years during the Confederation period, where the uh, the problem, the, the economy, uh, becomes a real issue. We suffer what most nations suffer whenever a war ends, kind of a post-war recession. Um, the, the, the need to supply the military is gone. The, the, the market for uh, farmers to sell produce uh, to the troops is gone. And so there's a period of readjustment, a period of recession almost following every every war. And the, the nation experiences that in the 1780s. And then there are also the kinds of vices or conflicts that Madison speaks about in his document, the vices of the political system. And so when you combine these, and of course what the, you know, what the textbooks do is they kind of lay the groundwork of all the problems and suggest that if the Constitution hadn't happened, if the you know the found, you know if the framers didn't come to the rescue by reforming the articles or replacing the articles with the constitution of the united states then all the positives all the potential that came with independence might be lost and uh, i will suggest and I, I haven't mentioned this before but i think it's well worth mentioning many of you probably are familiar with this most of the treatment of the confederation period um, is based on a book that was written uh, in the late 19th century um, called The Critical Period, John Fisk, F-I-S-K-E. John Fisk wrote the book called The Critical Period, which is the period of the Confederation. It is a superb book. Uh, it, it is still available, uh, but let me tell you that it is available 
on the Internet at no cost because it is a classic. Um, it's 100 years old. There's obviously no money to be made in selling it because there aren't that many people out there trying to buy it. So, therefore, uh, it's been made available. If you uh, Google critical period, the critical period, you will see under Google Books, uh, John Fisk's book, and you can read the entire book online. Uh, if you go through, uh, if you have a Kindle with Amazon, uh, you can get John Fisk's critical period practically free, if not free. It, it is, even though it's 140, 40 years old, it is an excellent book. The, the sources that John Fisk has access to are incredible. I think the most interesting thing is, in the late 19th century, when John Fisk writes, he, he by, by necessity, he's getting his sources from Federalist. He is, he is writing the critical period. He is writing his book from notes and journals and official records and letters of the Federalists, of the Madisons and the John Jays and the Hamiltons, and he's looking at the Federalist papers, uh, uh, and you know, w which are written by the supporters of the Constitution. The point I'm trying to make is what what makes John Fist's book suspect in in terms of 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 being solid history is that his resources tend to come only from one side of the debate from the winners, from the Federalists. And that's understandable. That's all he has access to. In the 19th century, we weren't able to do the kind of voter analysis within state legislatures and all the rest of it that technology now enables us to do. Now, because we have the computer and we have all of this technological uh, hardware that we didn't have before, it's now possible for historians to go into debates in state legislatures and process the votes of every delegate in, on every issue and establish the existence of groups that voted together. In other words, we can tell how many times specific individuals voted together, how many times they veered away and voted, you know, opposite uh, to, to, to other people and that kind of thing. So in other words, what historians have been able to do is, the, is determine the existence of the, you know, the, the beginnings of a party system developing within state legislatures and within Congress itself during the Confederation period. John Fisk didn't have access to any of that. So all John Fisk had going for him is what those who, have le who left records and left letters told us about the Confederation period. So John Fisk, in calling it the critical period, talks about the fact that obviously the period was critical and the nation as an independent nation was in danger of going under had it not been for the reform that the Constitution makes possible. So again, that is a very, very, uh, it, it seems to me, important book and it is available online free. Uh, so if you Google the critical period, John Fisk, um, the thing about Fisk's book, in spite of the weakness, you know, the fact that, it, that the resources only come from one side, that's the downside. The upside is he is an incredibly good historian. He makes incredibly valuable use of the resources he has. The first couple of chapters of his book is one of the best treatments of the internal politics that's going, that are going on in Great Britain Prior to, the, prior to independence that I've ever seen. What John Fisk does is reveal for the first time the politics between nations within which the American struggle for independence took place, the interplay between the Dutch and between the French and the British. And, of course, we know as many people will say that the United that, that America never would have won its independence had it not been for the military support we received from France. The story of how we get that, the diplomacy of Benjamin Franklin, uh, is is 
absolutely critical to this. And John Fisk lays out the internal situations of British politics. One of the things that John Fisk makes very clear, for example, is that while America won its independence and while Washington was successful as commander-in-chief of the Continental Army, the fact of the matter is, if American independence hadn't been eventually at the last, at, you know, toward the end, a good thing for Great Britain, we, would, we probably wouldn't have made it. In other words, one of the things that becomes very clear is that France and England are engaged in high-level diplomatic relations and independence for the 13 colonies becomes a pawn, becomes a chip in that international game. And it is very, very interesting. One of the things that, that I find impressive is that, to me, as I read John Fisk, the person that comes out of that book looking really good and moral is Vergen, the French foreign minister. Because the treaty with the United when, when when France and the United and the colonies enter into their treaty of alliance in 1778, one of the things they agree to is that neither one will conduct negotiations, try to make peace or conduct negotiations with the British without the other. Vergen abides by that treaty obligation. Franklin does not. Nor does Great Britain. And of course, very Great Britain's not a party to that alliance, so that she she doesn't count. But, but the point is that Virgin never violates the treaty of alliance that he has with the thirteen colonies, and I find that very impressive, because at that time, most people made these agreements for convenience and and nothing else. It, it, it was considered to be, it was almost expected, that if the circumstances called for it, you'd violate treaty commitments whether, in fact, they were written down or not. And uh, Virgen seems to, at least according to John Fisk, Virgen seems to stand pretty uh, pretty firmly uh, on, on his word. And and I, I think that's pretty noble. But anyway, uh, if you are, are interested in John Fisk's books, you can go to Google and you can get the whole thing on the Internet. You can read it at your leisure. Uh, one other thing, <laughs> you know, one thing leads to another. <laughs> Sometimes facetiously, students will say, uh, when you ask them for a definition of history, uh, they'll usually say one damn thing after another. And uh, the way I'm approaching this, it almost looks like that's true, because it seems like every time I mention something, I'm, I'm thinking of something else. I just wanted to make a, a, a point, which I, which I think is, is it's an observation, but I think it's, it's one that you might uh, find, well, helpful and worthwhile. One of the things you'll notice in John Fisk's book, if you go on Google, is the table of contents. Unlike our table of contents today in our books, which are which tend to be very limited, uh, they just list the titles of the chapters. Sometimes, if it's a detailed um, table of contents, they will list under the heading of the title of each chapter, they will list the subsections of each chapter sometimes. Uh, and th that becomes very helpful because if you look at the table of contents and you are at all familiar with the subject at hand, you can pretty well look at the table of contents and get a pretty good idea as to what the scope of the book is before you even read it. That's a tremendous time saver, obviously. If you look at John Fisk's table of contents in his critical period, in his book, The Critical Period, you will be amazed. The table of contents runs for about 30 pages. It is huge. What John Fisk does in the table of contents literally is tell us almost page by page what's in every page of that book. Talk about helpful. Talk about helpful to a person who, who perhaps is reading wants to read the book or wants to look up a certain aspect of that particular story, the table of contents is incredibly helpful. And the reason I mention this is because 
that tended to be more the rule than the exception in history books until the last 35, 40, 40, 50 years or so, last half century. Any, anything that was published, you know, more than 50 years ago tended to have a much more in-depth, much more specific and helpful table of contents than the stuff we publish, than, we, than the stuff published today. And a lot of that has to do with the publishers themselves. They, they want you to buy the book, so they, they, they're, their priority is to give you as little information as necessary. They want to give you enough information to spark your interest so you'll buy the book, but they don't want to give you so much information that you won't have to buy the book. In other words, you won't have to read the book. You can stand there in the bookstore, bookstore and just skim through it and get everything you need, and therefore there's no need to buy it. They, they don't want to do that. But that, that was not true 100 years ago. When John Fisk wrote his book, the table of contents literally was an outline of the whole book. Extremely helpful because it's an extremely informative. With that, I'd like to uh, move from our program yesterday uh, into uh, the announced program for today, which is Madison's Federalist Number 10. Again, I I'm not operating on any pattern here. I'm trying to present. Of course, this is the third week of our program. What I'm trying to do is select the kinds of subjects, the kinds of topics, which I believe will lay the groundwork and do the most good in order to basically satisfy the, the intent of the people who tune in. You know, obviously, uh, if nobody listens, if nobody cares at all about this, then there's no reason to do it. And so, obviously, my intent is to try to fulfill the needs and the wants and the expectations of the people that tune in. So what I'm guessing is if people tune in to a program on the, on the study of the U.S. Constitution, then it seems to me critical that we open the series by presenting some of the major aspects and the major issues that people will expect to find. With that rather shoddy introduction, I would suggest to you that most experts believe that Madison's Federalist Number 10 may just be the most important political document written in American history other than the Constitution and the Emancipation Proclamation and the Declaration of Independence themselves. Because in Federalist Number 10, the complexity of the Constitution is addressed by the author of the Constitution. And I think that's very significant. Historians and political scientists have been playing with Federalist Number 10 since it was written. Because those who study this subject immediately realize that of all the Federalist Papers, and, and I'll, I'll try to lay a little bit of background for the Federalist Papers, the ratification struggle, you know, after the Constitution is ratified in the convention, it is, it is sent to the Continental Congress. Because remember, the Confederation still exists. The Confederation Congress still exists. So it is sent to the Confederation Congress with, instruct with instructions or a request that it be sent to the states which belong to the Confederation for purposes of discussion and ratification. And the, the document itself contains its own formula for ratification. The document will be ratified by special conventions of the people in each state called for that purpose. A couple of things to mention. The first is that if one were into legalisms, if one were to, to make legal judgments, one would have to say that you could argue that the Constitution of the United States was illegal. The Articles of Confederation required a unanimous vote of all 13 states to amend it. 
to cha- change anything in the Confederation, in the Articles of Confederation, required the unanimous approval of all 13 states. No sooner does the Constitutional Convention meet than the host, Governor Edmund Randolph of Virginia, basically suggests that those who know have concluded that the Articles of Confederation has so many weaknesses, so many flaws, that it would be a waste of time and impossible to revise it, even though most of the delegates have been elected or chosen to attend the conference, to attend the convention, with instructions from their states that the purpose of the convention was to revise the Articles of Confederation. The call to the convention was to, to each state to send delegates to a convention for the purposes of revising the Articles of Confederation. That's why the delegates were sent there. No sooner do they meet, no sooner does the convention begin come to order than the original, the announced purpose of the convention, which is revision of the Articles of Confederation, is altered. And instead of revision of the Articles of Confederation, the convention is confronted with the Virginia Plan, which is a totally new form, a new system of government that is being proposed. So technically speaking, because the, art, the, convention, the Constitution will replace the Articles, clearly revising them, um, it would require the, the votes of all 13 states. So technically speaking, the Constitution of the United States didn't get that. When the convention addresses the issue of how can we revise this, they make the decision that nine states of the 13 will be sufficient to put the Constitution into effect. So they decide on nine of 13 rather than a unanimous vote of all 13. And, of course, the reason for that is obvious. Madison says in his vices of the political system, that you never get, you can get 13 state legislatures to agree on anything. And the fact of the matter is, only 12 states show up at the Constitutional Convention. Rhode Island refuses to send delegates. So, by definition, there's no way to get the unanimous vote of all 13 states when one of them is not even represented there. So, from the very beginning, from the get-go, the convention is operating on very, very tenuous legal circumstance, you know, legal grounds. So that's the that's the first thing. Anyway, the point is that the convention, one, the Constitution, once it's ratified, goes to the goes to the the Congress, the Confederation Congress, for for distribution to the states for purposes of ratification by special conventions of the people. And then each state begins, undertakes the process of holding elections for delegates, calling the convention, and holding the vote as to whether the Constitution is ratified or not ratified by that state. And then the results are sent to Congress. The story of the... We we will, in in our programs to come we will begin to look at the ratification process because it's fascinating. The, 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 the ratification process is fascinating. But it's very obvious that, uh, you know, as the states go through ratification process, the first one is Pennsylvania. Uh, the first convention to meet is Pennsylvania. The first state to ratify is Delaware. For obvious reasons, Delaware is a small state. It has everything to gain by equal representation in the Senate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, there's, there's very specific reasons why some states ratify. But we don't go th- too far through the ratification process before the issue of amendments come up. And states start to basically accompany ratification with an expectation that there will be amendments added, especially a Bill of Rights, that there will be a Bill of Rights added. And as the process goes through state by state, the lack of a Bill of Rights, the absence of a Bill of Rights in the Constitution becomes a major political issue. 
until by the time you get to the spring of 1788, when Virginia's convention, ratification convention meets in June of 88, Madison himself is forced at the ratification uh, uh, convention. Madison is forced, is promises the convention that if Virginia ratifies, he personally will make it his number one priority that there will be a Bill of Rights added to the Constitution. And then Madison runs for, once the Constitution is ratified and elections are held for the first Congress, Madison runs for the first Congress, uh, and Madison makes the first order of business when he gets there, the adoption of the Bill of Rights. So he follows through on his obligation. And in fact, you know, by this time, he's not only become a reluctant supporter of amendments, he becomes an advocate for them. He, he, once, it, once, he, once he caves on the need for amendments, he becomes an, an advocate for them, provided he's the one that decides what the amendments will be and how they will be written and all of that. That's, that's another story. We'll get to that. Well, after Virginia ratifies in June, uh, there are enough states. Uh, you know, it only calls for nine, and there are nine states. But without Virginia, ratification would be kind of a joke. It's kind of it would be it's kind of like the League of Nations at the end of World War One going into effect with the, without the United States belonging to it. I mean, it, you know, how effective could the League of Nations be without the nation that proposed it? And that, 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 of course, is the Woodrow Wilson story that many people, many people know. So obviously, Virginia is the largest and, and most powerful and wealthiest state of the 13. So it stands to reason that even though technically there are nine ratifications, the fact of the matter is if Virginia doesn't ratify, the general sense is that it can't be successful. Well, after Virginia ratifies in June, the next major obstacle is New York. And again, like Virginia, New York is a powerful state, a big state, and its ratification is deemed critical. And there are major opponents. There are prominent people in New York who support ratification, the most obvious two being John Jay and Alexander Hamilton. But there are also very prominent people who oppose ratification. One of them is the governor, Governor Clinton. And so the struggle, the election for seats in the ratification uh, uh, election, the, uh, the election for delegates is a heated election. And indeed, the anti-federalists, the opponents of ratification, do very well in New York. Uh, they do very well in several states. It's a toss-up as to whether the Constitution is going to be ratified or not, not just in New York, but several other states as well. And it's at that point that Madison joins Alexander Hamilton and John Jay, and they begin to write the Federalist Papers. They begin to publish in the newspapers of New York a series of essays explaining the various parts and safety checks and the checks and balances system and the separation of powers and all the internal checks and balances that they believe ought to reassure the voters that the Constitution is safe. And, of course, they're operating on the marching orders given by Benjamin Franklin at the close of the Constitutional Convention that the most important thing is to get this Constitution ratified. We can amend it later. We can fix it later. And so what he urges the delegates is don't focus on the things you don't like. Focus on the fact that we've got to get this thing approved. And so Franklin makes the case that the Const if the Constitution is not approved, then the, then the alternative is anarchy. And, of course, he's pointing to Shays' Rebellion, and he points out, that there are incendiary circumstances that exist in many of the states similar to Massachusetts. So there's a possibility that Shays' Rebellion could break out in any number of places. And there's no military, there's no power to put it down, etc. So Franklin's position is the delegates have to put, the, put aside their concerns about things that they would change, and they have to become advocates for this document. 
when they go back to their home states. And so the, the Federalist Papers fall into the category of that process. There are a total of 85 Federalist Papers, 85 essays printed in the New York newspapers, and they are picked up in other states as well because they're so well done that other states pick them up as well and run them in their newspapers so that the people will begin to see what and understand what the major issues associated with the Constitution are about. Federalist number 10 is just that. It is the 10th paper. It is written by James Madison, and anybody that had any doubts, because they don't sign, they all sign the name Publius, P-U-B-L-I-U-S, uh, after every one of the Federalist Papers. They do not put their own name. They put the pseudonym Publius. So, it, you know, on the surface, it's not clear who wrote it. But once you read Federalist Number 10, and especially knowing about Madison's vices of the political system that he wrote the month before, the similarities are so obvious that it's pretty clear that Madison wrote Federalist Number 10. In fact, we know now pretty much who wrote all of the papers. And it's very interesting. Most of the first ones, I think, uh, I think John Jay writes ten of them, and he writes about eight of the first. The you know the first seven or eight are by John Jay, and most of them focus on foreign policy. John Jay's focus is on relations with other nations, and so the the first several, I think, the first six Federalist Papers focus principally on relationships with other nations and gaining the respect of other nations and, and being seen as an equal partner in the world of nations and all the, re all the rest of all the things that you would assume um, we would be concerned about from a foreign policy perspective. John Jay writes those. That's, that's, his, that's his primary interest. And then John Jay uh, experiences some health problems. And Alexander Hamilton picks up the, the gauntlet, so to speak, most of the Federalist Papers are written by Hamilton. But Madison writes several, and he writes several of the key ones. And the most essential one of all is Federalist Number 10. Uh, there are two. Uh, Madison writes Federalist Number 51, which is also considered to be one of the priority uh, Federalist Papers. That's the one in which Madison says, if all men were angels, we wouldn't need government at all. Uh, that's a very, very important one. We'll look at that later on. But I wanted to begin with the most important one uh, early in our series uh, here on the Virtual Center for the Constitution, Study of the Constitution. Uh, so I wanted to deal with Federalism 10 number first. Uh, first. And um, I finally had a thought. Uh, I, it finally occurred to me that I need to give you, you know, repeat the phone number. So let me do that before we get into Federalist number 10. If you are inclined to call, by all means, feel free to do that. The number is area code 304-658-3333. That's area code 304-658-3333. I would, I would jot that number down, and, and, you know, if something occurs to you and you want to want to call, don't wait for me to give it because I tend to be very forgetful. But especially as I get older, I have more and more senior moments, uh, and I think many people out there know what I mean by that. Um, but uh, you know, if you have the number jotted down, you can uh, you, you can refer to it if you are, are so inclined. So with that, uh, let's begin. Uh, we're uh, about about three quarters of the way into our first hour, so we'll we'll have about fifteen minutes to look at at Madison's Federalist Number Ten, the opening lines. Then we'll take a break. Then we'll come back in our second hour, and we'll we'll really get into the into the heart of the of the document. The one thing that uh, that you will find about all the Federalist Papers, besides the fact that they are signed Publius, is that all of them are addressed to the people of the state of New York for, for reasons which I just explained. These documents are written in support of ratification within the New York ratifying convention election. So, and this one is Federalist number 10, it is first published in the New York Daily Advertiser on Thursday, the 22nd of November, 1787. So the Constitution, the Constitutional Convention adjourns on September 17th. 
And this document is two months and five days after that. Madison Federalist Number 10 appears in print. And the subtitle, the title of this article, besides being Federalist Number 10, the title of this one is The Utility of the Union as a Safeguard Against Domestic Faction and Insurrection. And in parentheses, this document includes the word continued. So Madison has already begun to raise the issues of domestic faction, of inter internal discord that he raises in his vices in the political system. And that's what this is about. So the title of this piece is The Utility of the Union as a Safeguard Against Domestic Faction and Insurrection. It is very obvious that those people most concerned about the dangers within the Confederation that Madison speaks to, the issues of too many laws, the issues of uh, surrounding the injustice of the laws, the protection of the rights of the minorities against the power of the ma majorities, all the things he talks about, and especially the people that were frightened to death by Shays Rebellion in Massachusetts would know exactly what they were looking at when they saw an essay in the New York newspapers entitled The Utility of the Union as a Safeguard Against Domestic Faction and Insurrection. They would know exactly what this was about. Most of the common people, the average people, who spend most of their time trying to earn, just make a living, just trying to make it, they wouldn't probably, they would be able to understand the title, but they wouldn't really understand what went into that title, what goes into that title. Now, what I'm doing here is making reference to Otto's letter from September, from October of 86, suggesting that the, the leaders of the people knew exactly what the issues were, whereas the people in general would have difficulty understanding some of this. Some of this. As we look at Federalist Number 10, I, I'm, I'm going to preface this by suggesting, notice the language. Pay special attention to how Madison writes this document. It not only speaks to the fact that he, he has a masterful pen. That's not my phrase. That's... Uh, John Adams used that at the at the uh, uh, convention that drafted at the in the committee that drafted the Declaration of Independence. John Adams makes the point when the Congress appoints a committee of five to draft the Declaration. Once they have their first meeting, John Adams is the one that suggests that Jefferson write it, write it, write the document. And John Adams said, besides, you know, he John Adams makes the point to the committee and says. Besides the fact that Mr. Jefferson doesn't speak a whole lot in the Congress, what that means is he hasn't made enemies. And he said, on the other hand, there's me. I can't keep my mouth shut. And if my name is on this document, it, it'll be dead on arrival. So his position, his, his recommendation to the group is, let's let Jefferson write it because Jefferson hasn't made any enemies. And then Adams makes this beautiful point. Adams has a beautiful way of expressing himself. Adams says, besides Mr. Jefferson, everybody, you know, everybody knows that you are uh, known to, ha to write with a masterful pen. What a beautiful phrase. Can you imagine somebody saying you write with a masterful pen? What a beautiful compliment. Well, Madison writes with a masterful pen as well. And so I want, you to, I want you to appreciate the language. But I also want you to appreciate, first of all, what he is saying. And secondly, every once in a while would respond to what he's saying. Keeping in mind Otto's suggestion is that the people would have, the most people would have difficulty understanding what these, what these things are about. So with that... Uh, Let's just get on. We, we've got about till we take our first break. Let's just look at the first sentence or two, a couple of sentences, and, and, and try, if we can, to, to appreciate the language as well as the content. 
And I got to tell you that before we went on the air today, I basically took a moment of, you know, to reflect. And basically, my, my reflection focused on, I hope I can do Madison justice. Because this is absolutely to be able to get across how absolutely brilliant this is. James Madison. Among the numerous advantages promised by a well-constructed union, none deserves to be more accurately developed than its tendency to break and control the violence of faction. Period. First sentence. Among, I'm, I'm going back to elaborating, among the numerous advantages, among all the things, all the positives that we, can, we could expect from a union that is well constructed, and of course he's saying this in the context of a union that he believes is not well constructed, which is the Articles of Confederation, None deserves to be more accurately developed. In other words, of all the advantages that a well-constructed union can give us, the most important one, he uses the negative, none deserves to be more accurately developed than its tendency to break and control the violence of faction. So at this point, we don't know what faction, I mean, most of us know what the word faction means. But as you read this document, you don't know what he means by faction. He's probably going to tell us. But at this point, we don't know what faction means. The only thing we know is that it's bad. Madison has said that the best thing we'll get out of a well-constructed union is that it will be able to break and control the violence of faction. So Madison is linking faction with violence which suggests negative. Factions are bad. Okay. The friend of popular governments never finds himself so much alarmed for their character and fate as when he contemplates their propensity to this dangerous vice. Again, let's reflect. The friend of popular government, in other words, Everybody who supports the idea of popular government, everybody who favors a republic, everybody who favors a government in which the people participate, which the people play a significant role, the friend of popular government never finds himself so much alarmed. In other words, the friend of popular government becomes most worried about their character and fate when he contemplates their propensity to this dangerous fights, what Madison is saying is the negative of popular guns that accompanies them all is their tendency toward faction, towards this dangerous vice, which Madison has already told us is violent. So what he is suggesting is that if you support popular government, you run the risk of the government failing because of its tendency toward factions, towards the violence of factions. He will not fail governments. He will not fail, therefore, to set a due value on any plan which, without violating the principles to which he is attached, provides a proper cure for it. He, meaning the friend of popular government, will not fail, therefore, to set a due value on any plan. The friend of popular government will listen carefully to any plan which provides a proper cure for the violence of faction without violating the principles of popular government, the principles to which he is attached. After all, he is the friend of popular governments. So what Madison is saying is anybody who respects popular governments is desperate to find a way to retain popular government and, and still fix this dangerous tendency toward the violence of factions that will provide, you know, some system that will provide a proper cure 
for that, that tendency. Then he goes on and he says, the instability, injustice, and confusion introduced into the public councils have in truth been the mortal diseases under which popular governments have everywhere perished as they continue to be the favorite and fruitful topics from which the adversaries to liberty derive their most specious declamations. This sentence is, is an important one. The instability, injustice, and confusion introduced into the public councils. If you were reading this paper, this, this essay, you probably wouldn't really know what he's talking about. But if you had read the vices of the political system that Madison wrote the previous month, if you knew about the disorders, if you knew about the paper money, if you knew about the installment laws for debts, if you knew about the insurrections, if you knew about Shays' Rebellion, if you knew about the weakness of the central government, if you knew about the inability of government to put down popular insurrections, if you knew in the South about the dangers of whipping up the slaves and having them join a minority to make them a majority, if you knew about the dangers of a minority in the North whipping up the poor and the unemployed and creating a majority that way, if you knew all of those things that could happen, you'd be scared to death. Therefore, you would know exactly what Madison means when he says the instability, injustice, and confusion introduced into the public councils. That's what his vices of the political system was about. The number of laws, the mutability, the fact that the laws change, it seems like, overnight. One comes, one goes, another one comes, etc. So the laws change, there are too many of them, they're, they're, they're unstable, and they tend to be unjust. So, therefore, you would understand exactly what Madison is saying. So the instability, injustice, and confusion introduced into the public councils have, Madison says, in truth, been the mortal diseases under which popular governments have everywhere perished. What he basically is saying there is popular governments have always failed throughout history. When he says, have everywhere perished, he means throughout history, popular governments haven't made it because of their susceptibility to instability, injustice, and confusion, violence the propendency toward violence, and the fact that they tend to be unjust and unstable and confused. Madison said this has been the reason why popular governments throughout history have failed. That's why they have perished. As they continue to be the favorite and fruitful topics from which the adversaries to liberty derive their most specious declamations. Popular governments tend to be the favorite topics of demagogues, of those people who have ambition, who have self-interest, and see their self-interest fulfilled by whipping up the people, by, 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 by speaking to the people, by inflaming the people. In other words, popular governments continue to be the favorite and the favorite topics of those making specious declamations, those looking to win support for their own self-interest. And he says one other thing. These people are adversaries to liberty. In other words, the one thing all of these demagogues have in common is that they are not supporters of of liberty, freedom. The implication being that in whipping up the masses, they are jeopardizing the freedom of individuals. And they, throughout history, have done that. The valuable improvements made by the American constitutions on the popular models, he said. In other words, the state constitutions that we currently have under the Articles of Confederation, 
the valuable improvements made by the American constitutions on the popular models, both ancient and modern, cannot certainly be too much admired. But it would be an unwarrantable partiality to contend that they have as effectually obviated the danger on this side as was wished and expected. We've made tremendous strides. strides. Our constitutions have made tremendous advantages, uh, tremendous strides over what happened in you know, in, in ancient times, in former periods. But it would be naive to assume that we fixed the problem, because we have not. And so he said, as much as we wish that the changes we've made have fixed the problem, the reality is it would, it, it, it would be naive to assume, assume. It would be an unwarrantable partiality, he says, to contend that they have obviated the danger on this side as much as it is wished and expected. So we got a problem, guys. And after we pause for a four or five minute break, we'll pick up on Madison's problem. This is the, st the Center for the Study of the U.S. Constitution. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Uh, it is uh, nine minutes after the hour, and we've got the better part of an hour uh, to spend with James Madison. I, uh, I have a good friend uh, that I'm sure we'll be hearing from in our program in, uh, in the future. Uh, uh, his, his name is John Kaminsky, uh, and John makes the point all the time that uh, he lives in the 18th century. He only briefly comes out. And, and to be very honest with you, as I do this, I feel somewhat the same but uh, anyway, it is a pleasure to, uh, to be back with you. And uh, we've been looking at Federalist Number 10. Again, the phone number, if you would uh, like to call, if you have any question or comment or suggestion or idea or anything else, I would love to hear it, and I'm sure our listeners would as well. The number is area code 304-658-3333. That's area code 304-658-3333. And if you if you uh, if you'd like it, uh, my email address is w a o brian o b r i e n nine zero six at gmail dot com. That's w a o brian nine zero six at gmail dot com. We had read the first three or four sentences of Madison's uh, Federalist Number Ten. And uh, before we go on, I, I just, you know, we, we kind of pick through them, and this is kind of the way I do it. And, and um, what I'd like to do now is, is kind of just make one general comment before we, before we move on. Uh, if you can, just reflect for a minute about the people, um, you know, what we know in terms of the way most of us read. Uh, not, not those of us who read professionally i'm not talking about that we may read it if you know if you're an attorney you obviously have been have been uh, uh primed to read a certain way but i'm talking about the young people that are graduating from our schools in terms of reading i'm thinking of the situation let me uh let me share with you uh, we're going a little bit going back here to jefferson's idea of universal education but now we're talking about the practical impacts of that. Uh, think back to your days in grade school uh, or uh, even beyond, even into middle school or high school, into classes that you've been where the teacher will call on individual students and say, please stand up and read the first paragraph in the text or in the novel or the book or the poem or whatever, first stanza of the poem or whatever it happens to be, it doesn't matter. But let's assume it's history or, or government or something like that. And the teacher said, stand up and read the first paragraph. So the student gets up and reads. And the teacher said, very good, you may, you may be seated. And the student sits down. And the one thing that the teacher never does is say, can you tell me what the passage that you just read means? And we're back with Dr. Bill O'Brien. After a long delay, which uh, I can uh, claim, uh, I, I, it, 
technical difficulties. Technical difficulties have my initial uh, with them, but we won't we won't go into that at this point. Uh, we are back with the virtual study for the Center, uh, Center for the Study of the Constitution uh, after some technical difficulties, which I think I caused on this end, and I've had a number of people scurrying around, and I apologize tremendously. We are back. Uh, the equipment is fine. The person uh, sitting at the equipment is the problem. But anyway, be that as it may. We were, we were looking at Madison's Federalist Number 10. We'll obviously pick this up again tomorrow because, uh, you know, I really have done an injustice to Madison today because of the, of the technical difficulties. But let me go back and, and assume that I wasn't on the air. Audio, the, the audio wasn't up when I made this reference before. So if I'm repeating myself, I apologize. If we read the same five or six sentences that we read before break on Madison's Federalist Number 10, what I'm interested in is if you would take a moment to reflect on the level of reading that most of the people you know would bring to this document. And I would suggest that in my own experience, the auto letter to Virgin seems to be very, very pertinent here. As I read Madison's five or six opening statements, he uses the passive voice. He uses negatives. Very first sentence, he says, among the numerous advantages promised by a well-constructed union, none deserves to be more accurately developed than its tendency to break and control the violence of fractions. It would be much clearer and easier to understand if he said, among the advantages promised by a well-constructive union, the most important one would be such and such. That would be rather easy to understand. But when he said none deserves to be more accurately developed than its tendency to violate, then what you find yourself constantly doing are finding the proper modifier for the its, and we're dealing with the passive voice, and when he says that Complaints are everywhere heard from our most consider considerate and virtuous citizens. When he says, uh, the friend of popular government never finds himself so much alarmed for their fate, he will not fail, fail therefore, that he refers back to the friends of popular government. In other words, these kinds of very sophisticated mo moves associated with the way we read are absolutely vital to understanding this document. And most people can't make them. And the example that I used before, but I think I was off the air, so again, if I'm repeating myself, I apologize. Think about the situation where the teacher asks you to stand up and read these sentences, and you read them, and you're reading words. But the fact of the matter is, if the teacher had said, what exactly does that mean, that passage you just read, what does that mean? Most of us would have to say, huh, I don't know. And the point, the point I'm making is that Otto is correct, that most of us don't, most of us don't comprehend what we read. I, I mentioned uh, earlier that um, over the years in my teaching, I, I've had students who've come to me all the time for years and will say, I'm having real trouble. I read the stuff, but I can't, I don't know what I'm reading. And I read a paragraph, I get halfway through, and I forget where I am, and I have to go back and start again. And I just don't understand what I'm reading. And basically what that suggests is that people are reading at the level that Jefferson talked about during his first three years of universal education. But our reading levels haven't really gone beyond that. And, and that's the point. Most people don't read at this level Therefore, if they picked up the newspaper, first of all, in the 18th century, everybody didn't read the newspaper anyway because there were a lot of people that couldn't. But even the people who read the papers, if you read this long essay that, you know, that seemed to go on forever, that almost covered the whole first page of the newspaper, and this is what you were reading, you would get four or five lines into it and say, I'll wait for the movie to come out. You know, I, there's no way in the world I can understand this. That's the point that I'm, that I'm trying to make because I think it's very, very significant here. Let's go back to the sentence that 
that I think I read when we were off the air, and I'm going to repeat it. It's the very next sentence after we stopped at the break. Complaints are everywhere heard from our most considerate and virtuous citizens, equally the friends of public and private faith and of public and personal liberty, that our governments are too unstable, that the public good is disregarded in the conflicts of rival parties, and that measures are too often decided, not according to the rules of justice and the rights of the minor party, but by the superior force of an interested and overbearing majority. Let's just, for the rest of the week, we've got about, about eight minutes, seven or eight minutes left, so let's just concentrate on that sentence. Complaints are everywhere heard from our most considerate and virtuous citizens. The first question I would ask is, who are they? Who are the most considerate and the most virtuous citizens? Think about that. The best people? I would suggest that's what Madison is talking about. The best people are complaining. These people who are, he says, equally the friends of public and private faith. What does that mean? Well, you'd have to kind of know from the 18th century, but when they talked about public and private faith, what they meant was financial responsibilities, debt. The public faith is paying your taxes. Private faith, faith is paying your private debts. So complaints are heard from the best people, equally the friends of public and private faith. In other words, those who believe that it's very important to pay our obligations, whether they're our public obligations or our private ones, and the friends of public and personal liberty. These are friends of personal freedom. They are, they are friends of the idea of paying your responsibilities, paying what you owe. Complaints are heard from these best people that our governments are too unstable. And, of course, Madison talked about that in the vices of the political system, about the instability in our, in our public councils. And if you remember, he mentioned that up above in, the, in one of the opening sentences of this thing, about the instability, injustice, and confusion in our public councils. All right, now he's talking about the best people are complaining. Those who are friends of public and private faith and friends of personal and public liberty. Their complaints are that our governments are too unstable, that the public good is disregarded in the conflicts of rival parties. In other words, the competition between factions or interest groups in our public councils is causing us to disregard the public good. In other words, private interests are taking precedence over, public, over the public interest. And that measures are too often decided not according to the rules of justice and the rights of the minor party, the rights of the minority, but by the superior force of an interested and overbearing majority. What's the problem? The problem is majority rule. Um, think about it. The problem is that decisions are being made, measures are being decided, not according to what's right, not according to justice or the rights of the minority, but by the superior force of an interested and overbearing majority. In other words, Madison's major complaint, the best people are complaining because decisions are being made by the majority, by majority rule an interested and overbearing majority. Now, again, if you aren't a strong reader and you look at the language here, you would go back and you would say, factions, violence, dangerous fights, instability, injustice, confusion in the public councils, the mortal diseases under which popular governments perish, complaints by the best people, that our governments are too unstable, that decisions are not being made according to the, what's the, in the best interest of the public, but what's being, you know, what serves the interest of a particular group. Decisions are being made by the superior force of an interested and overbearing majority. This, to Madison, is a problem. Majorities are making decisions in our public councils on the state level. Madison says, however anxiously 
we may wish that these complaints had no foundation. The evidence of known facts will not permit us to deny that they are in some degree true. I wish, we all wish, that this wasn't the case, but the fact of the matter is we know that it is. It will be found indeed on a candid view of our situation that some of the distresses under which we labor have been erroneously charged on the operation of our governments, but it will be found at the same time that other causes will not alone account for many of our heaviest misfortunes, and particularly for that prevailing and increasing distrust of public engagements and alarm for private rights, which are echoed from one end of the continent to the other. Madison is basically saying that the major problem in our public councils, which means our state governments, is that decisions are not being made according to justice, according to the rights of the minority. They are being made by the power of an interested and overbearing majority within these legislatures. So in a sense, what Madison could be saying, this is my interpretation, what Madison could be saying if we had an opportunity to have an audience with him and said, do you mean this in Federalist Number 10, Mr. Madison? Do you mean that the problem is that our state governments are too democratic and the problem is that the wrong people are calling the shots and the best people, the most considerate and virtuous citizens the ones that are used to making all the decisions because they're the people most qualified to make them are complaining because they're not being listened to anymore and they're not getting their own way anymore. Mr. Madison, are you complaining because power in our public, in our state governments has shifted from the few to the many? Is that what you're complaining about? What do you think Madison would say? Because in effect, that's what he's saying in this first section of Federalist Number 10. What an unbelievable document. It is written in a way which average people couldn't understand. They would see violence. They would see injustice. They would see instability. They would see confusion. They would see uh, uh, mortal diseases. They would see governments perishing. They would see unwarrantable partiality. They would see all of these negative words. And they would say, oh, whatever's going to fix this, we got to fix it. This is bad. But if you really get into the language and you comprehend what Madison is saying, he is talking to a few about what the problems are under the Confederation. In a very, very sophisticated way, Madison is repeating what he said in the vices of the political system of the United States. He is saying the same thing. He's referring to the same issues, but he's doing it in a way which most people in the newspapers would not pick up on, but which the few would understand perfectly. So far, all we've done is talk about Madison's assessment of the problem, we haven't begun to address his formula for addressing, for solving these problems. And we'll do that tomorrow. And I promise that the technical difficulties will be less. And we'll be back tomorrow with the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution. This is Bill O'Brien. Thank you so much for listening today. Have a good evening. Please be safe.